Hello and welcome to the Summon, the African Summon, where we connect you to Africa and African culture through the works of Africa's writers. In today's reading, we take you to a time in African history, long before colonization, long before slavery, when the children of Africa were in Africa, where within kingdoms were ruled by kings and queens. A time when the history of Africa was orally handed down from one generation to the next by grouts. We take you to the kingdom of Mali. This is where Diti Niane recounts the story <coughs> of the history of some of Mali's kings. This is part history and part fiction. Please invite your friends, neighbors, and loved ones and join us at the fireside for this must read. Sundiata. The words of the grout, Mamadu Kore Koyati. <clears throat> I am a grout, it is I. Jelly Mamadu Koyati, son of Bintu Koyati, and Jelly Kedian Koyati, master of the art of eloquence. Since time immemorial, the Koyatis have been in the service of the Keita princes of Mali. We are vessels of speech. We are the repositories which harbor secrets many centuries old. The art of eloquence has no secret for us. Without us, the names of kings would vanish into oblivion. We are the memory of mankind. By the spoken word, we bring to life the deeds and exploits of kings for younger generations. I derive my knowledge from my father, Jelly Kedian, who also got it from his father. History holds no mystery for us. We teach to the vulgar just as much as we want to teach them. For it is we who keep the keys to the 12 doors of Mali. I know the list of all the sovereigns who succeeded to the throne of Mali. I know how the black people divided into tribes. For my father bequeathed to me all his learning. I know why such and such is called Kamara another Keita, and yet another Sibibe, or Traore. Every name has a meaning, a sacred import. I teach kings the history of their ancestors, so the lives of the ancient might serve them as an example. For the world is old, but the future springs from the past. My word is pure and free of all untruth. It is the word of my father. It is the word of my father's father. I will give you my father's word, just as I receive them. Royal grouts do not know what line is. When a quarrel breaks out between tribes, it is we who settle the differences. For we are the depositories of oath, which the ancestors swore. Swore, listen to my word. You who want to know, by my mouth, you will learn the history of Mali. By my mouth, you will get to know the story of the ancestors of great Mali, the story of him who, by his exploits, surpassed even Alexander the Great, he who from the east shed his ray upon all the countries of the west. Listen to the story of the son of the buffalo, the son of the lion. I am going to tell you of Magan Sudiata of Mari Jata, of Songolon Jata, of Nari Mangan Jata, the man of many, many names against whom sorcery could avail nothing. <clears throat> the first kings of Mali. Listen then, sons of Mali, children of the black people, listen to my word, for I am going to tell you of Sundiata, the father of the bright country, of the Savannah land, the ancestor of those who draw the bow, the master of a hundred vanquished kings. I am going to talk of Sundiata, Manding Diara, lion of Mali, Sogolon Jata, son of Sogolon, Nare Mangan Jata, son of Nare Manga, Sogo Sogo Simbon, Salaba, hero of many names. I am going to tell you of Sundiata. 
He whose exploits would astonish men for a long time yet. He was great among kings. He was fearless among men. He was beloved of God because he was the last of the great conquerors. Right at the beginning then, Mali was a province of Bambara kings. Of the Bambara kings. Those who are today called Mandingo, inhabitants of Mali, are not indigenous. They come from the east. Bilali Bonama, ancestor of the Keitas, was the faithful servant of the Prophet Muhammad. May the peace of God be upon him. Bilali Bonama had seven sons of whom the eldest, Lawalo, left the holy city and came to settle in Mali. Lawalo had Lata Kalabi for a son. Lata Kalabi had Dumal Kalabi who then had Lahilatu Kalabi. Lahilatu Kalabi was the first black prince to make the pilgrimage to Mecca. On his return, he was robbed by brigands in the desert. His men were scattered and some died of thirst, but God saved Lahilatu Kalabi, for he was a righteous man. He called upon the Almighty and Jin appeared and recognized him as king. After seven years' absence, Lahilatu was able to return by the grace of Allah, the Almighty, to Mali, where not expected to see him anymore. Lahilatu Kalabi had two sons, the elder being called Kalabi Bomba and the younger Kalabi Dauma. The elder chose royal power and reign while the younger preferred fortune and wealth and became the ancestor of those who go from country to country seeking their fortune. Kalabi Bomba had Mamadi Kani for a son. Mamadi Kani was a hunter king like the first king of Mali. It was he who invented the hunter's whistle. He communicated with the jinn of the forest and bush. These spirits had no secrets from him and he was loved by Kondolon Nisani. His followers were so numerous that he formed them into a mighty army which became formidable. He often gathered them together in the bush and taught them the art of hunting. It was he who revealed to hunters the medicinal leaves which healed wounds and cured diseases. Thanks to the strength of his followers, he became king of a vast country. With them, Mamadi Kani conquered all the lands which stretched from the Sakarani to the Bauri. Mamadi Kani had four sons, Kani Simbon, Kami, Kaminogo Simbon, Kabala Simbon, and Simbon. Tangno, Tangnogo Kelly. They were all initiated into the art of hunting and deserved the title of Simbo. It was the lineage of Bamari Tangnogop Keling which held on to the power. His son was Bani Neni, whose son was Belo. Belo's son was called Belo Bakon, and he had a son called Magan Kon. Also called Frako Magan Keigu, Magan the Handsome. Magan Konfata was the father of the great Sundiata and had three wives and six children. The three boys and three girls. His first wife was called Sasoma Berete, daughter of a great divine. She was the mother of King Dankaran Tuman and Princess Nana Triban. The second wife, Sogolon Keju, was the mother of Sundiata and the two princesses, Sogolon Kolon Khan and Sogolon Jamaru. The third wife was one of, Kam of the Kamaras and was called Namaje. She was the mother of the Manding Bore or Manding Bakari. 
who was the best friend of her, of his half brother, Sundiata. The poor fellow woman. <clears throat> Mangan Konfata, the father of Sundiata, was renowned for his beauty in every land. But he was also a good king loved by all the people. In his capital of Nyaniba, he loved to sit often at the foot of the great silk cotton tree, which dominated his palace of Kanko. Magan Konfata had reigned a long time, and his oldest son, Dankara Toman, was already eight years old and often came to sit on the ox hide beside his father. Well now, one day when the king had taken up his usual position under the silk cotton tree surrounded by his king's men, he saw a man dressed like a hunter coming towards him. He wore a tight-fitted trouser of the favorite of Kondoloni Sani, and his blouse over sewn with cowry showed that he was a master of the hunting art. All present turned towards the unknown man, whose bow polished with frequent usage shone in the sun. The man walked up in front of the king, whom he recognized in the midst of his courtiers. He bowed and said, I salute you, king of Mali. Greetings, all of you, Mali. I am a hunter chasing game and come from Sangaran. A fearless doe has guided me to the walls of Nyaniba. By the grace of my master, the great Simbon, my arrows have hit her, and now she lies not far from your walls. As is fitting, O king, I have come to bring you your portion. He took a leg from his leather sack, whereupon the king's grout, Nankuman Doa, seized upon the leg and said, Stranger, whoever you may be, you will be the king's guest because you respect custom. Come and take your place on the mat beside us. The king is pleased because he loves righteous men. The king nodded his approval and all the courtiers agreed. The crowd continued in a more familiar tone. Oh, you who come from the Sangaran, land of the favorites of Kondolon, Nisani, you who have doubtless had an expert master, will you open your porch of knowledge for us and instruct us in your conversation? For you have no doubt visited several lands. The king, still silent, got a nod of approval, and a courtier added, The hunters of Sangaran are the best soothsayers. If the stranger wishes, we could learn a lot from him. The hunter came and sat down near Nankomandoa, who vacated one end of the mat to him. Then he said, Grout of the king, I am not one of those hunters whose tongues are more dexterous than their arms. I am no spinner of adventure yarn nor do I like playing often with the credulity of a worthy folk. But thanks for the law which my master has imparted to me, I can boast of being a seer among seers. He took out of his hunter's bag 12 calories, which he threw on the mat. The king and all his entourage now turned towards the stranger who was jumbling up the twelve shiny shells with his bare hands. Nankuman Doa discreetly brought to the king's notice that the soothsayer was left-handed. The left hand is the hand of evil, but in the divining art, it is said that the left-handed people are the best. The hunter muttered some incomprehensible words in a low voice while he shuffled and jumbled the 12 carries uh, into different positions which he mused on at length. All of a sudden he looked up at the king and said, O oh king, the world is full of mystery. All is hidden and we know nothing but what we can see. The silk cotton tree springs 
from a tiny seed. That which defies the tempest weighs on its germ no more than a grain of rice. Kingdoms are like trees. Some will be silk cotton, others will remain dwarf palms, and the powerful silk cotton tree will cover them with its shade. Oh, who can recognize in the little child the great king to come? The great come from the small. Truth and falsehood, falsehood have both suckled at the same breast. Nothing is certain, but sire, I can see two strangers coming there, coming towards your city. He fell silent and looked in the direction of the city gates for a short while. All present silently turned towards the gates. The soothsayer returned to his carries. He shook them in his palm with a skillful hand and then threw them out. King of Mali, destiny marches with great strife. Mali is about to emerge from the night. Nyaliba is lighting up. But what is this light that comes from the east? Hunter, said Nakoman Doa. Your words are obscure. Make your speech comprehensible to us. Speak in the clear language of your savannah. I am coming to that ground. Listen to my message. Listen, sire. You have ruled over the kingdom which your ancestors bequeathed to you, and you have no other ambition but to pass on this realm intact, if not increased, to your descendants. But fine king, your successor is not born yet. I see two hunters coming to your city. They have come from afar, and a woman accompanies them. Oh, that woman, she is ugly. She is hideous. She bears on her back a disfigured hump. Her monstrous eyes seem to have been merely laid on her face. But mystery of mysteries, this is the woman you must marry, sire. For she will be the mother of him who will make the name of Mali immortal forever. The child will be the seventh star, the seventh conqueror of the earth. He will be more mighty than Alexander. But, O oh king, for destiny to lead this woman to, to you as sacrifice is necessary. You must offer up a red bull, for the bull is powerful. When its blood soaks into the ground, nothing more will hinder the arrival of your wife. Then, I have said what I had to say, but everything is in the hand of the Almighty. The hunter picked up his carries and put them away in his bag. I am only passing through King of Mali, and now I return to Sangaran. Farewell. The hunter departed, but neither the king Nari Mangan, nor his grout. Nankuma Doa forgot his prophetic words. Soothsayers see far ahead. Their words are not always for the immediate present. Man in his hurry. Man is in a hurry, but time is tardy and everything has its season. Now one day the king was sitting with his <coughs> and his suit now one day the king and his suit were again seated under the great silk cotton tree of Nyaniba, chatting as was their word. Suddenly their gaze was drawn by some stranger who came into the city. The small entourage of the king watched in silent surprise. The two young hunters, handsome and of fine courage, were walking along preceded by a young maid. They turned towards the court. The two men were carrying shiny bowls of silver on their shoulder. The one who seemed the elder of the two walked with the assurance of a master hunter. The strangers were a few steps from the king when they bowed and the elder spoke thus. We greet King Nari Mangan Konfata and his entourage. We come from the land of Do. But my brother and I belong to Mali. We are of the tribe of Traore. 
hunting and adventure led us as far as the distant land of Do, where King Mansa Nemo Diara reigns. I am called Olamba and my brother Olani. The young girl is from Do and we bring her as a present to the king. For my brother and I deemed her worthy to be a king's wife. The king <clears throat> and his suit tried in vain to get a look at the young girl, for she stayed kneeling, her head lowered, and had deliberately let her kerchief hang in front of her head. If the young girl succeeded in hiding her face, she did not, however, manage to cover up the hump which deformed her shoulder and back. She was ugly in a sturdy sort of way. You could see her masculine arms and her bulging breasts pushing stoutly against the, the strong pang of cotton fabric which knotted just under her armpit. The king considered her for a moment. Then the handsome man turned his head away. He stared as he stood a long time at Nakuman Doa. Then he lowered his head. The ground understood all the sovereign's embarrassment. You are the guest of the king, hunters. We wish you peace in Nyaniba. For all the sons of Mali are but one. Come and sit down. Slack your thirst and relate to the king by what adventure you left door with this maiden. The king nodded his approval. The two brothers looked at each other and at a sign from the older, the younger went up to the king and put down on the ground the calabash of water which a servant had brought him. The hunter said, After the great harvest, my brother and I left our village to hunt. It was in, the, in this way that our pursuit of game led us as far as the approaches of the land of Do, we met two hunters, one of whom was wounded, and the later, <clears throat> and we learned from them that an amazing buffalo was ravaging the countryside of Do. Every day it claimed some victims, and nobody dared leave the village after sunset. The king, Do. Mansa Nemo Diara had promised the finest reward for the hunter who killed the buffalo. We decided to try our luck too, and so we penetrated the land of Do. We were advancing warily, our eyes well skinned, when we saw an old woman by the side of a river. She was weeping and lamenting, gnawed by hunger. Until then, no passerby had deigned to stop by her. She beseeched us in the name of the Almighty to give her something to eat. Touched by her tears, I approached and took some piece of dry meat from my hunter's bag. When she had eaten well, she said, Hunter, may God requite you with the charity you have shown me. We were, <clears throat> we were making ready to leave when she stopped me. I know, she said, that you're going to try your luck against the buffalo of Do, but you should know that many others before you have met their death through their foolhardiness, for arrows are useless against the buffalo. But, young hunter, your heart is generous, and it is you who will be the buffalo's vanquisher. I am the buffalo you are looking for, and your generosity has vanquished me. I am the buffalo that ravishes the doe. I have killed a hundred and seven hunters and wounded seventy-seven. Every day I kill an inhabitant of doe, and the king, Nemo Diara, is at his wit's end, which deem to sacrifice to. Here, young man. Take this distaff, take this distaff and this egg, and go to the plain of Orantomba, where I browse among the king's crop. Before using your bow, 
you must take aim at me three times with this distaff. Then draw your bow, and I shall be vulnerable to your arrow. I shall fall, but shall get up, and pursue you into a dry plain. Then throw the egg behind you, and a giant mire will come into being, where I shall be unable to advance, and then you will kill me. As proof of your victory, you must cut off the buffalo's tail, which is of gold, and take it to the king from whom you will exact your due reward. As for me, I have run my course and punished the king of Do. My brother from whom... As for me, I have run my course and punished the king of Do, my brother, for depriving me of my part of the inheritance. Crazy with joy, I seized the distaff and the egg, but the old woman stopped me with a gesture and said, I have one condition, Hunter. What condition, I replied impatiently. The king promises the hand of the most beautiful maiden of Do to the victor. When all the people of Do are gathered and you are told to choose her from whom you want to choose her whom you want as a wife, you must search in the crowd and you will find a very ugly maid, uglier than you can imagine, sitting apart on an observation platform. It is her you must choose. She is called Songolon Keju or Songolon Kondotu because she is a hunchback. You will choose her for she is a ray. She is my ray. She will be an extraordinary woman if you manage to possess her. Promise me you will choose her, Hunter. I swore solemnly between the hands of the old woman. And she continued on and we continued on our way. On the way, we saw hunters who were fleeing and who watched us quite dumbfounded. The buffalo was at the end of the plain, but when it saw us, it charged with menacing horns. I did as the old woman had told me and killed the buffalo. I cut off its tail and we went back to the town of Do as night was falling. But we did not go before the king until morning came. The king had the drums beaten and before midday, all the inhabitants of the country were gathered in the, main, in the main square. The mutilated carcass of the buffalo had been placed in the middle of the square and the delirious crowd abused it, while our names were sung in a thousand refrains. When the king appeared, a deep silence settled on the crowd. I promised the hand of the most beautiful maiden of Do to the brave hunter who saved us from the scourge of the overwhelm the scourge which overwhelmed us. The buffalo of Do is dead, and here is the hunter who has killed it. I am a man of my word, hunter. Here are all the daughters of Do. Take your pick. And the crowd showed its approval by a great cheer. On that day, all the daughters of Do wore their festive dress, gold shone in their hair, and fragile wrists bent under the weight of heavy silver bracelets. Never did so much beauty come together in one place, full of pride, my quiver on my back. I swaggered before the beautiful girls of Do, who were smiling at me, with their teeth as white as the rice of Mali. But I remember the words of the old woman. I went round the great circle many times until at last I saw Songolon Keju sitting apart on a raised platform. I elbowed my way towards the crowd, took Songolon by hand, drew her into the middle of the circle, showing her to the king. I said, O oh king, no more Diara. Here is the one I have chosen from among the young maids of Do. It is her I would like for my wife. The choice was so paradoxical that the king could not help laughing. 
and then general laughter broke out and the people split their sides with mirth. They took me for a fool and I became a ludicrous hero. You've got to belong to the tribe of Traore to do things like that, said somebody in the crowd. And it was thus that my brother and I left Do the very same day, pursued by the mockery of the Conde. The hunter ended his story, and the noble king, Nari Magan, determined to solemnize his marriage with, with all the customary formalities so that nobody could dispute the right of the son to be born to him. The two hunters were considered as being relatives of Songolon, and it was to them that Nankuma Doa bore the traditional colonel. By agreement with the hunters, the marriage was fixed for the first Wednesday of the new moon. The 12 villages of Old Mali and all the people allied to them were acquainted with this, and on the appointed day, delegations flocked from all sides of Nianiba, the town of Mag Magan Confata. Sogolon had been lodged with an old aunt of the kings. <clears throat> Since her arrival in Nianiba, she had never once gone out, and everyone longed to see the woman for whom Nani Magan was preparing such a magnificent wedding. It was known that she was not beautiful, but the curiosity of everyone was aroused, and already a thousand anecdotes were circulating, most of them put about by Sasuma Barete, the king's first wife. The royal drums of Nianiba announced the festivities at crack of dawn. The town awoke to the sound of tam-tams, which answered each other from one district to another. From the midst of the crowds arose the voice of Grouch singing the praises of Nari Maran. At the home of the king's old aunt, the hairdresser of Nianiba was, paint, was plating Songolon Kaju's hair as she lay on her mat. Her head rested on the hairdresser's leg. She wept softly while the king's sisters came to chaff her as was the custom. This is your last day of freedom. From now onwards, you will be our woman. Say, for, say farewell to your youth, added another. You won't dance in the square anymore and have your ad and have yourself admired by the boys, added a third. Sogolon never uttered a word. And from time to time, the hairdresser said, there, there, stop crying. It's a new life beginning, you know. You will be a mother. You will know the joy of being a queen surrounded by your children. Come now, daughter, don't listen to the gibes of your sisters-in-law. In front of the house, the poetesses who belonged to the king's sisters chanted the names of the young bride. During this time, the festivity was reaching its height in front of the king's enclosure. Each village was responsible. Each village was represented by a troupe of dancers and musicians. In the middle of the courtyard, the elders were sacrificing oxen, which the servants carved up while ungainly vultures perched on the great silk cotton tree watched the hackathon with their eyes. <laughs> Sitting in front of the palace, Nari Magan listened to the grave music of the balloon <clears throat> in the midst of the courtiers. Doa, standing amidst the eminent guests, held his great spear in his hand and sang the anthem of the Mandingo kings. Everywhere in the village, people were dancing and singing and members of the royal family envied their joy as was fitting by distributing grain cloths and even gold. Even the jealous Sasuma Berete took part in the Lagues 
and among other things bestowed fine loin clothes to the poetesses. But night was falling and the sun had hidden behind the mountains. It was time for the marriage procession to form in front of the house of the king's aunt. The tam-tams had fallen silent. The old female relatives of the king had washed and the perfume and perfumed Songolon, and now she was dressed completely in white with a large veil over her head. Songolon walked in front, held by two old women. The king's relatives followed, and behind the choir of young girls of Mali sang the bride's departure song, keeping time of the songs by clapping their hands. The villagers and guests were lined up along the stretch of the ground which separated the aunt's house from the palace in order to see the procession go on. When Songolon had reached the threshold of the king's antechamber, one of his younger brothers lifted her vigorously from the ground and ran off with her towards the palace where the crowd cheered. The women danced in front of the palace of the king for a long while. Then after receiving money and presents from members of the royal family, the crowd departed and night darkened overhead. She will be an extraordinary woman if you manage to possess her. These were the words of the old woman of Do. But the conqueror of the buffalo had not been able to conquer the young girl. It was only as an afterthought that the two hunters, Aulani and Aulamba, had the idea of giving her to the king of Mali. That evening then, Nari Magan tried to perform his duty as a husband, but Sogolon repulsed his advances. He persisted, but his efforts were in vain, and early the next morning, Doa found the king exhausted like a man who had suffered a great defeat. What's the matter, my king? asked the growl. I have been unable to possess her. And besides, she frightened me, this young girl. I even doubt whether she is a human being. When I draw close to her during the night, her body becomes covered with long hairs. And that scares me very much. All night long, I called upon my rake but he was unable to master Sogolon's. All that day the king did not emerge and Doa was the only one to enter and leave the palace. All Nyaniba seemed puzzled. The old women who had come early to seek the virginity pine had been discreetly turned away and this went on for a week. Nari Mangan had vainly sought advice from some great sorcerers, but all their tricks were powerless in overcoming the raid of Sogolon. One night, when everyone was asleep, Nari Magan got up. He unhooked his hunter's bag from the wall, and sitting in the middle of the house, his spear on the ground, he spread on the ground the sand which the bag contained. The king began tracing mysterious signs on the sand. He traced and effaced and began again. Sogolon woke up. She knew that sand talks, but she was intrigued to see the king so absorbed at dead of night. Nari Madan stopped drawing signs, and with his hand under his chin, he seemed to be brooding on the signs. All of a sudden, he jumped up, bounded after his sword, which hung above his bed, and said, Sogolon, Sogolon, wake up. A dream has awakened me out of my sleep, and the protective spirit of the Mandingo kings has appeared to me. I was mistaken in the interpretation I put upon the words of the hunter who led you to me. The gene has revealed to me their new meaning. Sokolon, I must sacrifice you to the greatness of my house. The blood of a virgin of the tribe has <clears throat> the, the blood of a virgin 
of the tribe of Kunde must be spilled. And you are the Kunde virgin whom fate has brought under my roof. Forgive me, but I must accomplish my mission. Forgive the hand which is going to shed your blood. No, no, why me? No, I don't want to die. It is useless, said the king. It is not me who has decided. He seized Sogolon by the hair with an iron grip. But so great had been her fright that she had already fainted. In this faint, she was congealed in her human body and her reed was no longer in her. And when she woke up, she was already a wife. That very night, Songolon conceived. That's all we have for you today, folks. Join us during our next episode to find out if the prophecy of the hunter comes true. Thank you for joining us for today's story. And from all of us at African Summon, thank you for responding to this summon. <laughs>